Hello and welcome to the 17th lecture of the course Statistical Thermodynamics. The topic of this lecture is entropy change for spontaneous processes and equivalence of the statistical and classical expressions for entropy change. According to the second law of thermodynamics, any spontaneous process is accompanied by an increase in entropy of the universe. Earlier on in this course, using the classical expression for change in entropy, ds is equal to dq reversible divided by t, we have calculated the change in entropy for several spontaneous processes and always found the second law to hold. In this lecture, we will calculate the change in entropy for some spontaneous processes using the statistical definition of entropy. We will see through these examples how the number of options or ways in which energy is distributed, that is the number of microstates, increases during a spontaneous change. We will also see the consistency between the classical and statistical expressions for entropy change. Let us begin with a simple example of a heat transfer process to get insight on how exactly the number of microstates increases in a spontaneous process. Let us say there are two identical solid objects. And to keep things really simple, let us say that each of these objects is made up of four atoms. Further, let us say that one of these objects has phi quanta of energy and the other has one quantum of energy. So this is the hot object and this is the cold object. When these objects are brought in thermal contact, and allowed to equilibrate, heat flows from the hot object to the cold object and the two objects end up having on an average three quanta of energy. Correspondingly, the most probable distribution of energy has three quanta of energy in each object. Let us calculate the number of microstates of the system of two objects before and after thermal contact. So number of microstates before thermal contact the cold object has one quantum of energy to be distributed among four particles. The quanta are indistinguishable and the particles are distinguishable. So there are four ways in which this can be done. For the hot body, there are five quanta of energy which are indistinguishable and this is distributed among four distinguishable particles. Now to count the number of ways, you can always explicitly list out 
the different ways or you can use a trick from Combinatrix and that's what we will do. So this can be mapped on to what is called the star bar problem. We can think of the five quanta as five stars and we can think of three bars corresponding to the four particles which will partition these five stars. The three bars will create four partitions corresponding to the quanta going into the four particles. Now to calculate the number of ways in which these quanta can be distributed, we can think of all possible permutation of these eight particles, eight factorial, but of course the stars are indistinguishable. So that gives a factor of five factorial in the denominator. And similarly, the bars are ind indistinguishable, which gives a factor of three factorial. Note that the bars are creating four distinct partitions corresponding to four distinguishable particles, but the bars themselves are indistinguishable, which leads to this factor of three factorial. And this gives 56 ways. The total microstates before thermal contact is equal to the number of microstates in the hot particle and the number of microstates in the cold particle. So the total microstates are 56 times 4, that is 224 microstates before thermal contact. Let us now calculate the number of microstates after thermal contact. As we have discussed, the most probable distribution has three quanta on each object. So in other words, for each object, there are three quanta which are distributed among four particles. Using the star bar idea that we have just discussed, the number of microstates in each object is equal to 6 factorial divided by 3 factorial, 3 factorial. This corresponds to 3 stars corresponding to 3 quanta of energy and 3 bars corresponding to 4 particles. And so the number of microstates in the system of 2 objects is 20 times 20. This is, this here is 20. And so for each object there is 20 and the total number of microstates is 400 microstates. We can see that the number of microstates in the system before the heat transfer is 224 and that has increased to 400 microstates after the heat has transferred, which has happened spontaneously. So there is an increase of microstates during this spontaneous process of heat transferring from the hot object to the cold object. I hope that through this example, you can understand how the same amount of energy can be distributed differently and thus the number of options or microstates can be different before and after the process. Nature spontaneously moves in a direction where there are more options for the energy to be distributed or where the energy can be more spread out. I think this is not so hard to understand. If there are more options available, they would be taken. For example, when a piece of wood burns spontaneously, the energy which was clumped up in the piece of wood gets spread out after combustion. The same quantity of energy had less options available of being arranged in the wood, 
where it was in the form of chemical bonds of the carbohydrate molecules of the wood. But after combustion, it has more ways of being arranged in the freely translating carbon dioxide and water molecules and in the kinetic energy of the air molecules that get heated during combustion. Of course, you may wonder what happens to the second law of thermodynamics when the piece of wood is formed spontaneously by photosynthesis. Yes, energy is getting clumped up in the wood. But there are several other processes occurring simultaneously which are generating entropy and the net effect of all these processes is that energy is getting spread out and the entropy of the universe is indeed increasing as the piece of wood is formed. Let us now consider a process which we have looked at before while discussing classical thermodynamics and for which we have calculated the change in entropy using the classical expression for entropy change. This is the spontaneous expansion of a gas. Let me remind you of the situation. Let us say there is an insulated box like this. And the box has a partition in the middle. N molecules of an ideal gas are initially on one side of the partition. On the other side, there is nothing, it's just vacuum. When the partition is removed, the gas spontaneously fills up the entire volume. If V1 is the initial volume, and V2 is the final volume, then the change in entropy during this process is delta S is equal to nr ln v2 by v1 or nk ln v2 by v1. We have discussed this in lecture 10. So please look at this if you are not sure how we derive this change in entropy. Let us now calculate the number of microstates of the gas before and after expansion and thus calculate the change in entropy microscopically. For this, let us assume that these n particles are in a cubic box of sides A. Our goal is to calculate the number of ways in which energy E can be distributed among these n particles. The energy of an eigenstate of a particle in a box of side A is E nx ny nz is equal to 8 squared divided by 8 m a squared nx squared plus ny squared plus nz squared.
the degeneracy of a particular energy let's say e is the number of ways in which the integer m which is e divided by 8 squared by 8 m a squared that is 8 m a squared e divided by 8 squared so the degeneracy is the number of ways in which this integer can be written as a sum of squares of three positive integers. In general, degeneracy is an erratic and discontinuous function of m. Degeneracy is 0 for several values of m. For example, if m is equal to 3, then nx squared is 1, ny squared is equal to 1, and z squared is 1, and there is only one way in which you can get 3 to be a sum of 3 squares. Another example is when m is equal to 6. In that case, one of these integers nx, ny or nz could be 2 and the other two could be 1. And there are three ways in which the sum can become 6. So the degeneracy there is 3. The point is that for small m, the degeneracy is not smooth and there is no pattern to it. However, as m becomes large, the degeneracy as a function of m starts becoming smooth. We can understand this by considering a 3D space spanned by nx, ny and nz. There is a one-to-one -one correspondence between energy states E and the points nx, ny, nz where these are integers greater than zero. Let us look at this geometrically in two dimensions. It is just easier to show this in two dimensions, but you can easily imagine it in three dimensions. So in two dimensions, these are the grid points in the nx, ny space. Each point in the space has a one-to-one -one correspondence with a quantum state. Now, the degeneracy of a particular energy can be understood by considering a circle on this 2D plane like this. This circle with a particular radius r, all the points in the 2D plane that lie on this circle have the same value of energy. And you can see that as the circle becomes larger, there are many more points of the 2D plane which lie on the circle. And therefore, the degeneracy keeps increasing as the energy keeps increasing. So extending this to the 3D space, a sphere in the 3D space of nx, 
and y and z this was in the 2d space this is an x and y i forgot to label it earlier and this is r but extending this to the 3d space spanned by nx ny and nz a sphere in the 3d space of nx ny and z of radius r corresponds to r squared is equal to nx squared plus ny squared plus nz squared which is equal to 8m a a squared epsilon divided by h squared the degeneracy of a particular e is the number of lattice points that are at a distance r from the origin of this 3d space the question now is what is the value of degeneracy for a particular e in general this is a difficult question to answer but for large r we can proceed as follows we treat r or e for that matter as a continuous variable and ask for the number of lattice points between e and e plus delta e to calculate this we first calculate the number of lattice points consistent with energy less than or equal to epsilon for large epsilon an excellent approximation is made by equating the number of lattice points consistent with energy less than epsilon with the volume of one octant of a sphere of radius r to understand the idea that the number of lattice points is equal to the volume consider a cube in the nx ny nz space of sides nx equal to ny is equal to nz is equal to n clearly the volume is n cube and the number of points is also n cube using this idea let me write the number of states with energy less than epsilon and denoting this by phi of epsilon this is equal to 1 over 8 the 1/8 of the volume of and here's the volume formula this is pi by 6 r cube and writing the value of r in terms of epsilon from the previous page this becomes pi by 6 8m a squared epsilon by h squared and square root of this is r and raised to the power makes it to the power of 3 by 2
then the number of states between epsilon and epsilon plus d epsilon can be obtained by taking derivative so d of phi epsilon is pi by 6 8m a squared by 8 squared to the power of 3 by 2 this is all constant and then 3 by 2 epsilon to the power of half d epsilon and simplifying this this is pi to pi by 4 8 m a squared divided by 8 squared 3 by 2 epsilon to the power of half d epsilon now when epsilon is continuous that is the energy states are continuous the number of states between epsilon and epsilon plus d epsilon is the degeneracy of the energy epsilon so this expression here is the number of states that are there in a very small window of energy d epsilon or in other words the degeneracy of the energy epsilon as an example if we take energy to be 3 by 2 kt which is the average energy of an ideal gas particle at temperature t and let's say we take temperature is close to room temperature 300 kelvin and we take the mass to be something reasonable which is 10 to the power of minus 25 kg and for perspective the mass of an argon atom is 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 26 kgs and we take a box of sides 10 centimeters or 0.1 meter and let's say we take de to be 0 0.01 or 1 percent of the epsilon this is the small energy interval then in that energy interval the number of states d phi epsilon is approximately 10 to the power of 28 clearly the degeneracy of the average energy is very very large at room temperature now this d phi can be simplified a little bit and this can be written as pi by 4 8 m by 8 squared and we essentially take out a square from inside the brackets and then that becomes a cube epsilon to the power half d epsilon and this a cube can be written as volume so this is pi by 4 8 m by 8 squared to the power of 3 by 2 epsilon half multiplied by volume this is suggesting that the degeneracy of a particular energy or in other words the number of ways in which the energy can be distributed or arranged is proportional to the volume of the container in which the particle is everything we have talked about so far is for a single particle in a 3d box let us now extend this to n particles in a 3d box for n particles in a 3d box there are three n quantum numbers and they satisfy this relation nx j plus nyj squared plus nzj squared so here j is the index 
for the particle and this runs over n particles this should be equal to 8m a squared e total energy divided by 8 squared we have to extend our understanding in 3d space to 3nd space and in that a sphere in 3n dimensional space of nx j nyj nzj where j goes from 1 to n has radius r such that r squared is equal to sum over all the particles nx j squared plus ny j squared plus nz j squared and that radius is equal to 8 m a squared e divided by 8 squared. Now we have to make a extension of our concept of volume to 3n dimensional space and for a 3n dimensional space we can extend what we know for 2d space and 3d space to 3nd space and say that the volume is proportional to r to the power of 3n. We don't know the exact proportionality constant, but since volume in two dimension is proportional to r squared, volume in three dimension is proportional to r cube, we can extend that idea to this abstract three n dimensional space and say that the volume is proportional to r raised to its dimension or r raised to 3n. Also extending the idea of the number of states with energy less than or equal to e from three dimensions, we get number of states with energy less than or equal to e in this 3n dimensional space is phi e is proportional to r to the power of 3n which if we substitute the value of r from here we get that equal to 8 m a squared e divided by 8 squared to the power of 3 n by 2. So phi e is proportional to 8m by 8 squared to the power of 3n by 2 and let me take a squared out of the bracket so it's a squared to the power of 3n by 2 multiplied by e to the power of 3n by 2 and that is equal to some constant which depends on n and this a to the power of 3n is a cube or volume to the power of n so v to the power of n multiplied by e to the power of 3n by 2. This is the proportionality constant which depends on n. This is the expression for the number of states with energy less than or equal to E. So the number of states between E and E plus delta E is given by taking a derivative of this expression like we did for the three-dimensional case before. 
So d phi e is equal to c n v to the power of n 3 n by 2 e to the power of 3 n by 2 minus 1. As noted before, this is the degeneracy of E when E is continuous. The key result is that the degeneracy of energy of a n particle system is proportional to volume to the power of n. And let me write the implication of that for the number of ways in which energy can be distributed on the next page. So for a given energy E and number of particles N, the number of ways in which energy can be distributed is proportional to v to the power of n. This result tells us that the number of microstate is proportional to volume raised to the number of particles when there are n non-interacting particles in a container of volume V. This result can be used to calculate the change in entropy for the system of expanding gas where the gas was initially in one side of the partition and had volume V1 and after expansion the volume was V2. In that case the change in entropy is equal to k ln number of ways in the final state minus k ln number of ways in the initial state and that is k ln w final by w initial and using the result underlined above this is k ln v final to the power of n divided by v initial to the power of n and that is equal to n k ln v final by v initial. This is identical to the result from classical thermodynamics. Thus, the change in entropy during expansion is the same whether it is calculated using the classical thermodynamics expression or the statistical expression. The last thing we will do for establishing the equivalence of the classical and statistical picture of thermodynamics is to derive the classical thermodynamics formula ds is equal to dq reversible by t from the statistical formula s is equal to k ln w. We start by using the equivalence of S is equal to K ln W to S is equal to minus N K sum over I P I ln P I for a system of N particles where Pi 
is the fraction of particles in the state i in the most probable distribution. Now we have shown this result in the previous lecture. So see lecture 16 for derivation. We differentiate this with respect to pi. So ds is equal to minus nk sum over i pi by pi derivative of the log gives 1 over pi dpi plus ln pi dpi. And that is minus nk sum over i dpi plus ln pi dpi. Now sum over i dpi is equal to 0 since sum over i pi which is the sum of fractions or sum of probabilities is equal to 1. So the first term here is 0 and ds is equal to minus nk sum over i ln pi dpi. Now I will substitute the value of pi from the Boltzmann distribution into this expression and writing that on the next page ds is equal to minus nk sum over i ln pi dpi where pi is equal to e to the power of minus beta epsilon i divided by q. So ds becomes equal to minus nk sum over i ln of this quantity. So that is minus beta epsilon i minus ln of q d of pi. Writing the two terms inside this square bracket separately, this becomes nk sum over i beta epsilon i d pi plus nk ln of q outside the summation sum over i dpi. Sum over i dpi is equal to 0 for the reasons I have just discussed. So ds is just this term nk beta sum over i ei dpi. Let us now physically interpret the expression inside the summation. For that, let us consider the internal energy of a system of n particles and that is u is equal to sum over i n i epsilon i. You will recall this result again from the previous lecture or lecture 16. This can be written as capital N sum over i the fraction of particles in the state i epsilon i. Now from these two terms we can see that the internal energy can be changed in two ways. One way is to change pi 
while keeping epsilon i constant and the other way is to change epsilon i while keeping p i constant. The first one corresponds to supplying heat to the system. When we supply heat, the energy levels don't change, but their occupation changes. And if there is an infinite decimal amount of heat, that heat is reversible. So dq reversible is equal to n sum over i dpi, which is indicating a change in the fractions or populations multiplied by epsilon i. On the other hand, changing epsilon or the energy levels as a way to change the internal energy corresponds to doing work. When work is done, the volume of the system changes. Therefore, the translational energy level changes. You will recall that the energy dependence of the states of a particle in a box depend on its volume. So the infinite decimal amount of work done, dw, that is reversible, is equal to n sum over i pi derivative of epsilon i with respect to the volume at constant n multiplied by dv. These are the microscopic interpretations of supplying heat or doing work on a system of n particles. Using this microscopic picture of heat supplied to the system in this expression for change in entropy, this becomes k beta dq reversible. We have substituted for this expression here. Finally, since beta is equal to 1 over kt, ds is equal to dq reversible by t. We have thus obtained this classical formula for the change in entropy using the statistical definition of entropy. I hope you are convinced by now that the statistical and classical picture of entropy change are equivalent. Moreover, the statistical picture gives us more information and insight about the system than the classical picture. I hope you are able to appreciate that if we simply know the energy levels of a system, which for a molecule we can get from scratch using quantum mechanics, we can using statistical thermodynamics get the partition function and from there all macroscopic properties of the system. Very, very cool. In the next part of the course, you will learn to apply the fundamental ideas we have discussed up to now to actual chemical systems. You will need several new definitions and concepts to be able to do that and I am sure it will be very exciting. Goodbye for now and best wishes.